Speaking of Courage Podcast, what's going on, Chase? Not a whole lot. What's up, man? Not much, man. Not much. Back again. Yep. How you doing? Pretty good. You? Good? Yep. I'm good, man. <laughs> Where are we headed today? Uh, going back to Vietnam, or I should say sticking with Vietnam. Yeah. Uh, we're going to do a little different today. We've done some infantry guys. We've done some pilots. This is going to be a door gunner on a helicopter. Door so, gunner on a helicopter. Yeah. What what branch is that? Army. Army. Well, it, I mean, Navy had helicopters in the Vietnam War. Air Force actually had helicopters, Marines. It was it was cross branch, but we're doing Army. Okay. If you haven't what? figured it out yet, yeah. I'm partial to the Army guys. <laughs> were these guys, these guys had to be pretty crucial in this in yeah, Vietnam, yeah. Right? Door, uh, door gunners, the way I look at it is um, door gunners is one of those MOSs or jobs that guys, when they get out of the Army years later and they're lying about what they did, they all say they were a door gunner or a oh, tunnel okay. rat. So if your job is cool enough that people are lying to say that they did it, it's a, it's a pretty cool, dangerous job. That's a that super sense. dangerous job, right? Yeah, yeah. How many, did a lot of helicopters go down in Vietnam? Oh, helicopters were imagine. constantly going down in Vietnam. That was one of the... Um, We'll, we'll get into that with this episode okay. on, on the amount. Uh, I'm not going to give you an actual number, but yeah, it was a frequent uh, thing. We've talked about the Air Corps and the aviation and things like that. Um, in World War II, the fear of going down in Vietnam, they were going down a lot, en- enough to where they would, you know, there's training on how to brace yourself and how to, if you have to jump out and do things like that. Did a lot of people were, survive them? Uh, a lot is relative. You could survive a helicopter okay. crash, yes. And then you're a target up there, for oh, sure. Oh, yeah, you're definitely a target. Yeah, that was iconic part of Vietnam is the helicopters and the, uh, the enemy can, we've talked about it before, you like know, a sitting duck, right? right? Well, you're like a sitting duck, but the enemy knows you're coming cause they can hear you. They're counting the rotors. They're seeing how many people are coming in. Those first waves that are landing, they're going to be vulnerable, um, until the other troops come in. So it's going to be those door gunners and those, those gunships and things like that, that are protecting those guys on the ground. What kind of gun are we dealing with? Well, with the door gunner, we're dealing with an M60. So it's the same infantry type machine gun they'd be carrying okay. on the ground, but it's strapped into the um, to the door of the helicopter. And who's our hero? Uh, a gentleman by the name of Gary Wetzel. Gary Wetzel. Gary, we- yeah, I like Wetzel's pretzels. Yeah, yeah that's, that's what I was thinking. Way to think of it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Gary Wetzel from uh, uh, South Milwaukee, Wisconsin, or Milwaukee if you're Alice Cooper in Wayne's World. Milwaukee. But uh, yeah, Milwaukee. So uh, a Midwestern guy, you know, salt of the earth, uh, good, good type of people. Uh, Gary's born in 1947 in Milwaukee. He's got a big family. He's got five sisters and three brothers. He's the second oldest in the family. A lot um, of these guys are the brothers. oldest, huh? They're He's the oldest brother too. and second. Yeah. And like we talked about, I think that, that that might have something to do with growing up caring for your younger siblings yeah. and um, kind of taking a leadership role in the family far younger than you should have to right um can breed uh, i think that that leadership and things like that yeah it gives them that mentality take care of their people yeah so how old is he so uh he joins the army at 18 he grows up with one of those typical i guess you want to call it a baby boomer lifestyle right the guys come home from world war ii they have the kids the kids are growing up in this you know wonder years type um t- type life they're looking up to their dads uh gary both his parents actually served in in world war ii in some capacity uh, he grew up being patriotic. His hero was John Wayne. He had yeah. uh, just just that that love of uh, love of country, being patriotic and things like that. His dad was in the American Legion. He was a Boy Scout, so he's learning to hunt and fish and and be outdoorsy. You think that was one of the best times to grow up in America? Ooh. That's all relative. Yeah, I mean, but look, that's what people look at, right? As yeah, like that's one of them. That's the the Wonder Years. Yeah, that's that. What's looked back with nostalgia, you know, the great music and the great. But there's a lot of civil strife and a lot of other things going on. I think, you know. You could look at any time period, fifty years on, and look back at it with rose-colored glasses and, yeah, and look exactly. at it that way. But there was there was a lot of good because I mean we grew up in the in the nineties and in a lot of ways that was fun riding yeah. bikes and skateboarding and not coming home till dark and stuff. Can't do that anymore. So yeah. you know they'll they'll be idolizing that in the in the future. Mm-hmm. Damn, that's crazy, man. Yeah. So, so then, what makes him want to go to the military? So son of a factory worker, he. Um, he said he never really had any plans on college. He was skipping school anyways in high school. When you look at pictures of Gary, he's, uh, he looks like... Have you ever seen American Graffiti? Mm-mm. Uh, he, he reminds me of those 1950s like, like cool guys with the cool cars and the big hair and stuff like that. He's always either got a cigarette in his mouth or his hand. He, just, he looks like a, a like hard a cool dude. Guy. Yeah, <laughs> factory working type guy. Um, Milwaukee, like I said, patriotism. It was, he said it was something he always wanted to do. So as soon as he turned 18, he went ahead and he, uh, he joined the Army. He went to basic training at uh, Fort Knox. At the time, basic training was about eight weeks long, but there was uh, spinal meningitis going around in the barracks, so they ended up being there for 12 weeks. And uh, because of the spinal meningitis, they had to sleep with their windows open, and it was freezing cold and stuff. So just those, those weird experiences. It's his, it's his first time being away from home. Yeah. But even though 
you know, he's a, he's a kind of a tough guy. And like I said, when you see these pictures, he actually enjoyed basic training. He said he enjoyed the structure of it. He enjoyed the, the discipline and things like that. Um, he said, if you did what they told you, you were good. If you didn't, you had hell to pay. And he didn't choose to pay hell. So he did what he was supposed to. And he was, he was a pretty good soldier. It's really interesting how a lot of these guys are like knucklehead, tough guys, skipping right. school, and then they get in the military and they just, if that structure well, serves them well. Some people, you know, if you're... If you're a tough guy and you're, you know, you're doing whatever you want in school and the teachers are rolling over and letting you, you, you don't respect them. You know? yeah. So when you get to somewhere where they're not going to push or they're not going to let you push at them, you know, the drill sergeants, things like they that, there's a, there's a respect. Yeah. And I think that that guides some of these people. That's why some That's people really like this cool. thrive in the military, I guess. So spinal meningitis is going through the barracks? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. There's, there's a lot. of. I mean, even right now with uh, COVID and stuff, the guys are going to basic. They're having to stay there twice as long. Some of the guys that were supposed to ship to their units got stuck in basic because they wouldn't move. So... Little things like that can can trip up your army career, and it can spread. That's what yeah. the Spanish flu and stuff. Uh, yeah, 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 exactly. My dad, uh, the, uh, when he he was the outstanding trainee in his platoon in basic training, so rather most of his platoon went to Vietnam. He was sent to like a shake and bake, they call it now, the leadership school. So he went to this leadership school to become an NCO, like almost straight out of basic, and he got pneumonia. So they sent him home. While he was at home recovering from pneumonia, they dissolved the leadership school. So then he ended up getting sent to Germany. So something a little fluke like that Damn, you change know, changed, your changed our family history and his yeah. history and things like that. So there's, yeah, there's a lot of that, you know, history turns on a dime and uh, personal people's history can, can turn like that. Man, so well. what year is this? Uh, this is going to be 1966 when he joined the army. So it's later? No, this is Early. like right when the war is picking up. So 65, we, we started major combat operations. You know, you got the 173rd Airborne, the first CAV and things like that. Um, this is, this is, we're not yet at this point when he joined to the major protests and riots in the street. So it's still not bad here countryside, right? Not, not terrible. Yeah. Not terrible. I'll, I'll say that. Yeah. Guys are still fired up to go. Right. Okay. Yeah. So he, um, he ends up being a uh, heavy equipment operator. They send him to another base, and his job is to train these other soldiers on heavy equipment operating. Again, he comes from this, this factory working background. So he's at Fort Leonard Wood, which is Missouri, and a lot of these guys that are coming home from Vietnam, they're on their two-year enlistments or, or two-year drafts or three-year enlistments. They come back from Vietnam. They know they're getting out, so there's, the Army doesn't have much to do with them. So they're sending them to these kind of technical schools, and he's training them there. So he spends his day training these guys on forklifts and stuff, and then... Uh, at nights, he's going to hang out on the range. He's learning how to use the M60 and getting familiar with it. And all these soldiers that he's cool with, they're telling him, like, hey, man, you're going to Vietnam anyways. You might as well just get over there and get it over with. And he's thinking, you know what? That, that sounds like a good idea. I want to go. It's going to happen anyway, so I'm going to go on my terms. So he puts in what's called a uh, 1049 form, which is a request. They, they, he puts in one, they tell him no. He puts in a second, they tell him no. And he's 18 years old at the time. Why are they telling him no? Uh, just because they need his, him to do his job oh, there. Okay. You know, the Army has... You're doing a good job. We don't want to have to bring someone in and have to train train them up while while you're already over here doing it, right? So he puts in his third one, and 26 days later, he's in Vietnam. They're finally like, "All right, shut the fuck up. Damn. You want to go that bad? Go." So he ends up 26 um, hour plane ride to Vietnam. You're gonna hear a lot of the same experiences. The more you listen or talk to Vietnam vets. 26 hours on a plane is miserable, and I know that because I've been on a plane for 26. Have hours. you? Yeah, coming home from Iraq. When we went over, we flew. I think we stopped in Ireland and the Czech Republic, and then we went and we landed. On the way home, we flew from Baghdad to Kuwait to Turkey, and they wouldn't let us off the plane, so you're just sitting there. And then we stopped in Ireland, and then in Maine. We ended up being on the plane for a total of 26 hours. And when you're staying on, or when you're stopping in places, you're just sitting, staying we were, put? Turkey wouldn't let us off the plane, so you're just sitting there. We, it's the Army, so you still have to shave and you know, be well-groomed and stuff. So there's, you know, when, when it comes morning time, there's a line at the bathroom door, so you can shave in those little bathrooms. You eat breakfast, lunch, dinner, and breakfast on the plane. It was oh, man. god-awful miserable. Was it? Yeah, they handed out sleeping pills, and for some reason, they didn't work on me, so I was just awake the whole time with my little cd player with like two batteries so i was just <laughs> looking out the window for 26 hours Misery. but i was on a commercial jet gary was on uh like a c-130 or a transport plane right just loud just sitting there loud for 26 hours just misery you know thinking about your own thoughts thinking about there, and there's like seats in it there's like netting i'm sorry netting and seats you're you're they're not what you would traditionally call a seat. No, it's, it's like little places to sit off and to the side and stuff. So just a massive body, like a cattle car, you know? So you're not sitting in like a defined location. You definitely don't have your feet up and a tray table down or anything <laughs> yeah. like that, if that's what you're asking. Yeah. yeah. So, so 26 hours, and like I said, the part where uh, a lot of Vietnam, Vietnam vets will find familiar, they, they tell them, all right, we're making our final descent into Saigon, and you, you're getting you're excited, you're getting anxious. 
then they open that ramp and you immediately get hit with that smell and that, that heat and that humidity because the, the plane's pressurized. But when they open the door, it goes from cool to just nasty, muggy. And then you kind of realize, shit, this is, these are the decisions I've made have led me to this. Yes. So you get this real uneasy feeling kind of like, man, what did I do? And they're and, at some kind of a base, right? Yeah, so they're landing in Saigon, which is the capital city. It's the major hub where everybody, everybody starts there and then they're going to get farmed out to their units and stuff like that. And what is Saigon like? So have you ever seen Full Metal Jacket? Yeah. I was going to say I should just stop asking you. I know, you never yeah. say yes, but uh, <laughs> Full Metal Jacket is, is a good representation. Uh, I mean, it's not a good rep, but just a bustling city. There's a lot of people moving around, people trying to sell you things, just a, a mass hive of humanity, people on the streets selling, you know. Um, they would get on buses, and a lot of, again, the Vietnam vets would always mention, they had a chicken wire on the windows, and they'd be like, what's the chicken wire for? It's because people would run by and try to toss grenades in so they would get hurt. But um, at the same time, you know, you have your prostitutes, you have your vendors, you have your bars. You had some guys, the higher command in Saigon, living it up, living the high life. You know, they have, like, these, like, palatial estates and stuff like that. So it's really? a weird place. It's not the bush, as you call it. It's not the okay. jungle. Yeah. And then you get bussed out or helicoptered out to Yeah, then you'll get taken be. to another base, and then usually, uh, like, a repo center, like, the where they're going to go down names and call you out by your MOS. Hey, you're going over here. You're going over there. Then you catch a ride to whatever unit you're going to. Wow, that's crazy, man. Yeah, what a might, culture shock that would oh, be. Oh, yeah. Might be there a few hours. Might, well, the, the military has a beautiful way of processing people like you're just animals. Yeah. You know, here, you take this, but this doesn't fit. I don't care. It will later. Just pushing you Figure to the next out. one. Yeah, give them a shot or something and then push them to the next one. Uh, so it's it's uh, it's chaos. You, you lose your humanity real quick and you kind of realize that you're not worth much. Really? Yeah. And then so where's he headed from there? So he gets supply. Um, he ends up in a uh, ordnance outfit. So he's, a, he's like a supply guy because he does all this factory equipment work. That's his job there, right? Yeah. So they're supplying convoys. All these convoys that are taking all these supplies all around the country, they stop where Wetzel's based, and he's doing the forklifts. He's doing the getting the supplies off, getting them to these trucks so they can take them all over the country. And there, this is, again, we've talked about, you know, the glory all goes to the grunt. Glory always goes to the grunts, but these guys are working one, you know, 24 hours, 48 hours on, just trying to get all this stuff to these grunts. And, and this then they, is what? Ammo, food, everything exactly, you need. Exactly. That's exactly what it is. Ammo, food, equipment, anything you need. Anything that goes wrong, you come back here and you get it. And what a they, crazy operation when you break it down like that. You're going to a foreign country and massive. you got to bring cities worth of stuff yeah. in mm -hmm. and then just, just get to it, function. Just I mean, very efficient. Just think huh? of ammo and just think of batteries. And then you go down the line food, then think of toilet paper and Boots, equipment and socks, yeah, beer because yeah. it's Vietnam. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know? um, so there was a lot of partying going on? Yeah, yeah, to a degree. Um, so actually with him, he ends up, when he gets to his one year mark, he's been in the army a year, there's a program where you can re-enlist after you've been in a year. So, and you can pick your assignment. So he doesn't want to be a supply guy. He wants to be a door gunner, right? So when he gets to his one year and one day, he re-enlists for three years to become a door gunner, which is crazy. Most people, you've been in Vietnam a while, just take it easy. You know, go home he and lie. Gone home. Go home and lie and tell people you're door gunner. No, his tour's not over yet. Yeah. He just extends it. Um, so he actually becomes a door gunner. He gets assigned to the uh, 173rd Assault Company. They're called the Robin Hoods, the uh, 11th Combat Aviation Battalion. And he starts to learn to become a door gunner. And fortunately for him, he already has all this previous training on the M60 and the M16 because he spent all his off hours doing that yeah. back, back in the rear. So he gets to his unit. And again, he's this tough, Harley-riding, cool guy. He gets to the unit and he fits right in because these, these aviation guys, they immediately... They welcome him, and they do so by giving him a ton of beer and just partying. So he wakes up, goes on his first mission, and he's got a hangover real bad. So they're up in the air. They get to the point where they level off, and he's got to pee because he's been drinking beer all night. So he doesn't know what to do. So he leans out the window, and he decides to pee out the, out yeah. the open side of the door. He's hanging on by a strap. Have you ever tried to pour a Coke out of yeah, your car? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so all that pee just comes back in. <laughs> so he's covered in pee. The helicopter's covered in pee. They go pick out some grunts, and the grunts are like, well, why does it smell like piss in here? And he's like, I don't know what you're talking about, right? <laughs> um, so yeah, so the life of a door gunner and these aviation guys, there's, there's slicks, there's gunships, there's dust-offs. Have you ever heard any of those terms? Mm -mm. So a slick is like, if you think of a Huey, the helicopter, yeah. they're, they're the ones that are going to be picking up guys and dropping guys off. Every time the infantry guys go somewhere, these guys are dropping them off. The gunships are like those Cobras, and they have all the rockets and stuff, and then the dust-offs are the medics that are, that are picking those guys up. So it's not okay. going to be the same. So he's, on the, he's the gun. He's protecting these guys as they're landing. He'll be protecting them with his machine gun as they're descending and things like that. And the same thing when they go to pick them up. So he ends up, 
um, in Vietnam until uh, August of 1967 when he ex- extends his tour. During that time, he's shot down three times. He survives three different helicopter crashes. So wow. we were talking about that earlier. It's common enough that there, his job as the door gunner in these crew chiefs is to tell the grunts like, like how to brace for impact and what to do and stuff because you're going down, right? Because unless they get hit to where they're you know, exploding in the sky, they're, they're in a free fall almost, or they're in that, that, that spin, dead spin. dead spin, so they're telling them what to do and they're surviving. But he actually survives three helicopter crashes as, as a door gunner in this. And, and to me, helicopters aren't as scary as, as planes, but helicopters are... are yeah. that, can you imagine being up you know, 1,500 feet, 1,800 people feet, you're descending, you. people are shooting at you? And he talked about that. He talked about you'd see the tracers going by, and he said he was scared every time. Every time um, they would start to descend and he was too high to shoot back, he would just close his eyes because he didn't want to see the rounds hit him, he said. Oh, man. But when you'd get in closer and he said when you started firing that gun, all the fear would go away. As soon as you started pulling that trigger, get all on the, the fear would go away because huh? you're, you're giving it back, basically. Yeah. So is, when these uh, helicopters are going down, are you bracing? Are you jumping out? What it do you depends. Do? Well, you're, you should be bracing. You should be following their commands. But I've read, uh, I think it was Doc Platoon Medic was the book, where they told them how when you get above the rice paddies a certain distance to try to dr- jump and free yourself. And he, the uh, guy that in Doc Platoon Medic survived by doing that, jumping into the water and skipping off, basically. Really? But more than likely, you're going to die unless, unless you're getting lucky like... Uh, like Gary, Gary's avoided was. three of them. Yeah, he's survived three of them. Yeah. Wow, man! Yeah, we did a little bit of helicopter training in the army, and it was those helicopter guys are nuts. Nuts. The crew chiefs, the pilots, and yeah. all, and the uh, the door gunners. We were doing training at Fort Hood, Texas, and we were they were they'd hover above the ground, and we would jump out onto the ground. So then they you know they had to up the ante because I wasn't scared enough. So we started doing it on buildings. We would jump off onto the buildings, and it was cold, and it was night, and the wind was blowing so bad. So they flew us over, and then they're like. Uh, it's too windy. We got to stop. I'm like, oh, thank God. It's not safe. So then we yeah. fly around. They're like, oh, never mind. Let's do it again. So they, they go back and we're flying above oh the building. Gosh. And uh, I just remember those crew chiefs. How no- I'm terrified. I had my machine gun and they're just sitting out there yelling, you know, and uh, they're like, go, go, go. And uh, this guy Trevino, he jumps out before me and I look down and he's on his face because he fell. So I'm like, I don't want to jump because I don't want to land at him. And by now the helicopter is rising and the crew chief goes, get the fuck out of my bird. And he just grabbed me and <laughs> threw me out. And I fucking fell and I landed on Trevino and you just get up and you run from the prop <laughs> wash and stuff. But it's scary. And I mean, that's, that's their day-to-day life. So it's almost like an art form, man. Yeah. And they, they like to screw with you too. Cause I remember flying in the helicopter one time and I was clearly scared. So the helicopter guy just starts like climbing out the window and stuff, the, <laughs> the crew chief, cause he's got his little monkey strap on him and they don't, they don't care. You know, yeah. they're, they're playing their game. Totally used to it. Yeah. But in, uh, in August 1967, he extends his tour again because he's up clearly nuts, right? Yeah. So he wants to stay there longer. So he gets to go home for a 45-day leave. While he's home, he said he's, you know, he's watching the news and he's, he's just feeling guilty. He's seeing you know, you know, guys are killed in Vietnam and helicopter goes down and stuff. So he wants to go back. But he's, he's obviously he's getting apprehensive as well because, I mean, it's, it's, that's a, that's he's, a he's, scary he's thing. Very, he's very aware of the danger that's, exactly. that's going on. You know what I mean? But it's that weird almost survivor's guilt and that soldier's heart and things like that where yeah. it's um, you don't want to be there. You don't want to be – you don't want to die, obviously. But if your friends are over there experiencing it, you don't want to be Yeah, that would be a weird it. feeling, huh? Yeah. But over, he ends up going back. Over the course of his time in Vietnam, he's on hundreds of missions, hundreds of missions, picking up and dropping off these soldiers, um, going through just you know tons of ammunition, just shooting at the enemy from, the, from up high, shooting them all on the ground. He's seeing a lot too, right? He's seeing a lot. Wounded, on, dead. Yeah, every, like time you, every time they're the wounded and there's wounded and dead soldiers, someone's got to pick them up. It's these guys. So they're dragging them on board. You know, They're trying to talk to these guys. You're seeing the worst that Vietnam has to offer. And then you're putting even worse, those dead bodies on there with the ponchos on them or not ponchos on them. Those guys so you're that are basically the up. filter for the battlefield. Exactly. And he's, and, everything. and he's 19 years old at this time. Right. Damn. So in November 27th of, uh, of 1967, he's shot down again. This is the fourth time he's shot down. And this is the third time he's shot down with his pilot, Timmy. So four times he's been shot down with now. the same pilot, with the same, <laughs> with the same, Friggin so pilot. when he goes home, he's fully aware of the dangers. He's seen it already. Yeah, exactly. So when he's going back and feeling guilty and wanting to get back in the fight, right. he's fully aware of exactly. what the fight is. He knows what the fight is. He's seen literally the worst Vietnam has to offer. If you figure, even an infantry guy, um, you're seeing blood, you're seeing carnage, you're seeing all those things. But once the bodies are, you know, you may not be in that much combat. Or if you are in combat, you know, you patch up your buddy and then you see him go away. Somebody has to stay with them the rest of the time. So he's, Wetzel's seeing 
all the wounded. Wetzel seeing, you know, because they're moving around all over the country picking yeah. these guys up and stuff. So yeah, they're seeing guys that have been shot, guys that have been blown up, guys that have been stabbed, guys with their heads off, guys that are burned shells. And of think bodies. about him on leave, man. He's here with his family and his friends, and they're hanging out. They're probably exactly. going out. Yeah. And he's choosing to go back. Right. That takes courage, right there. Exactly. Getting back on that. Well, he already has extended his tour. He yeah. reenlisted and he chose a combat job when he didn't have to, and now he's extending his tour to. Um, to make it even longer when, when by all rights and accounts, he's done more than he should have to do. Absolutely, man. Yeah. So his, uh, his Medal of Honor action, January 8th, 1968. Now we're at the height of the war. 1968 is arguably, 68 and 69 were the worst time. Highest casualties, the Tet Offensive, just... How is it back at home? That's when it's This popping. is when, you know, people are calling people baby killers and yeah. throwing things at them and calling people's families and telling them, I'm glad your son died and stuff wow. like that. Yeah, this, this is what you think of Vietnam. It's 1968. This is that time. So he's in a place called Ap Dong, which is Three Corps, which is in South Vietnam. So it's kind of what you'd think of as Vietnam jungles, but it's that, that delta where there's a lot of rice paddies. Do you know what a rice paddy looks it's like? It's like the water. Uh, yeah, so it's like water and then the, like the dikes and stuff yep. like that. That's, that's, um, that's where he's at. And they're doing what's called, uh, he called them eagle missions, which from my understanding is they're, they're going around and they're, they're picking up troops and dropping them off, right? Because the troops are looking for contact, basically. So his, his uh, helicopter, he's with Timmy, that same pilot that he's already been shot three yeah. down, t- down three times with. They should probably stay away from each other. Yeah. And then their uh, crew chief, who's, uh, I believe his name is Bart. And those guys are both short, meaning they're getting to go home soon. Their tour is almost over as well. So... Their helicopter is supposed to be in reserve. They're not even supposed to be that day. But one of the other helicopters has mechanical problems, so they get they get called in. So they spend the whole day kind of hopping around, um, you know, picking up troops, dropping off troops, picking up troops, dropping off troops. They stop at a place called French Fort where they're just getting ready to eat. So they're eating their chow. They haven't seen much contact all day. You know, it's just just kind of what you'd call a regular day. All of a sudden, these four Australian helicopters come in and land. And they're just shot to shit. They're, they're torn up. Their guys are bleeding. They're all messed up. So the commanders start to get together. Hey, what happened? And the Aussies are telling them about 1,000 meters that way, there's a huge mass of enemy, and we just got our asses kicked. So the Americans go, well, let's go get them, right? That's yeah. what we do. So the Americans, uh, the Aussies join the Americans, and there's about 14 uh, gunship, I'm sorry, helicopters. They're filled with the infantry guys, and, they're, and then they have the gunships with them, and they're going to go attack this enemy position. You know, this is what we get paid for. Nobody is, oh, no, the enemy, let's run. They're like, oh, yeah, let the enemy, let's go get, get them. Some. Let's go get some. That's what we're trained to do. So the way it's supposed to work is you have your gunships go in first. You have almost two waves of helicopters. So your gunships are going to go in, and they're going to shoot the shit out of everything, machine guns, rockets, more, or, you know, explosions. They're going to be blowing these guys up, keeping the enemy's heads down, getting them to, to, to cower into their trenches, killing as many as they can. Then while their heads are down, the, the uh, slicks are going to land, and the infantry is going to get off, and they're going to go recon by fire and try to kill these guys, right? Yeah. But something happens. They, they mess up. So he's in the second helicopter, and he's going, you know, where, where are these gunships? And he look, and they're, they're behind them, right? They're supposed to be in front of them, but it's too late because they're already starting to descend. So now all these guys, this first wave of helicopters is landing, and there's nothing to protect them except for their M60 machine guns, which is not enough. We, you know, we need rockets, and we need machine guns, and we need all of these things. So the gunships are supposed to be ahead the of them, mowing everybody be, down. Exactly. Okay. But they messed up, so, but it's too late, so they're going in. They, he's, as they go down, some of the guys that were there, they said that it looked like about 8 million VC stood up. Obviously, it's not, it's not really that many, yeah. but the whole jungle just opens up with gunfire. All these guys are shooting. They're shooting rockets. They're shooting AK-47s. They're shooting their rifles. They're shooting everything at these helicopters. And like you said, you're a sitting duck. You're not controlling this ride. This is like you're on a theme park, and it goes where it wants to go, and you're just there trying to hold on. So when they get about 15 to 20 feet from the, from the ground as they're descending, you know, the infantry guys are bracing, getting ready to get out. The pilot's trying to maneuver it in. They get hit directly with an RPG, a rocket-propelled grenade. Think like Black Hawk down. Hits them right in the nose of the helicopter. So they come into a skidding crash. This is crash number five for him. Damn. <laughs> um, blows up the whole front of the helicopter, and the, the, the helicopter goes down. As soon as the helicopter hits the ground, they just get lit up because that's a huge target now, right? The enemies, they're winning this battle. They're shooting. They see the helicopter go down, so they just light it up in this, cross, this crossfire. One of the infantry guys tries to jump out, and he's immediately just lit up. He's, part of his brains are blown out onto Wetzel, uh, and he ends up dying, slumping over Wetzel's gun. A uh, couple other guys are getting hit. It's just chaos everywhere. Wetzel's first thought is, I got to get Timmy, because Timmy's his friend. Timmy's in the, is in the helicopter. So him and his crew chief, Bart, they start crawling around. So Wetzel runs around to the front. Bart unhooks him. When he gets to Timmy, he sees that his whole lower body of his, lower half of his body is just shattered. It looks like hamburger meat, because he got hit with that RPG, you know, the metal from the, uh, the fuselage of the helicopter, p- potentially bullets. He's just destroyed, but he's still alive, okay? Damn. So Wetzel's got his Tommy gun, his Thompson submachine gun on his right hand. 
Uh, the crew chief unhooks Tommy. Wetzel picks him up and he starts carrying him. He starts running around the side of the helicopter because for some reason he decides this is going to be the safer spot. I got to get, I got to get over um, to to this area where I can put him down and we can get cover. As he's running, he, he hears his crew chief. He yells, duck, and he looks and he sees a VC throwing a, basically a homemade explosive at him. So he gets blown back. He drops Timmy. He gets blown against the helicopter and he looks down and his arm's completely shattered. So if you try to put your arm out, his is just hanging down from the left elbow. There's, there's nothing there but ribbons of shred and flesh, right? Ugh. So he yells out as loudly as he can, son of a bitch. And then he turns and he sees the enemy's about to throw another grenade. So he shoots him with his Thompson. He, he fires and he kills him. And as the VC one-handed. falls back, yeah, one handed, he's one handed for the rest of this fight. Yeah. The VC falls back and his grenade explodes and potentially kills some other people. So he says he's happy. So he, um, he crawls around and he's trying to help Timmy. At some point, him and the crew chief, they, they make tourniquets out of some, some cloth and some ribbons and things, and they are able to um, put tourniquets on his legs. They're trying to, to keep him alive, basically. So they, they crawl to the front of the helicopter. There's explosions going off. There's people screaming. There's other helicopters landing. There's just blood and death everywhere. They don't know where these rounds are coming from. They're hearing machine guns. He's starting to lose consciousness. Um, he is, his wounds consisted of his arm was literally hanging off, he had a shrapnel in his chest. His left calf muscle was hanging off, and he's just littered his whole body. So he's bleeding everywhere. The crew chief is bleeding. He's got shrapnel in his face, and Timmy's whole lower body is destroyed. He's just the sh- They're screwed. What used to be a man, yeah. And then there's these infantry guys that are running around too, and they don't know what to do. They're trying to get in the fight, but it's just, just pure chaos. So they're laying there trying to figure out what's, what's going on, basically. And then he, um, he looks at Bart, and Bart yells, watch out. And then they realize that the enemy's closing in and they're killing people. They're coming in and they're killing the wounded, right? So he doesn't have a chance, so he lays down. He's kind of half submerged in the water, and he says he's so badly wounded that he looks dead anyways. And again, so does, so does Timmy, and then so does his crew chief. So they all play dead, and he, the, the enemy comes so close to him that their boot's just stepping in the water right next to his face. So he's just bracing. He's waiting, he's waiting, he's waiting to get shot in the head, and then they finally shoot him in the foot. So he just takes it because he doesn't want to get oh found out, gosh. right? So he's already... His arm's hanging off. That's not an exaggeration. That's not hyperbole. His arm's literally hanging off. He's, he's bleeding from all over. His wounds are submerged. He's laying next to the, the wreck of Dirty this helicopter. Right in this, yeah, you know what they um, fertilize the rice paddies with, right? No. It's feces, but they often use human feces, so they'll just shit in these rice paddies and stuff. So he's uh. laying there. So as they're shooting him, some Americans from another position open up on the enemy. So they run around to the front of the helicopter. So... He decides, he, he keeps using phrases like, I had a little zip left in me. So he crawls to the front of the helicopter and he sees the enemy and they're trying to take his M60. They're trying to take his machine gun. So he stands up and he yells, hey, and then he lights them all up. He kills all six of these guys with his, mach- or with his Thompson submachine gun. These guys that oh, just shot him in the shit. foot. So he's able and he's to, one-handed. Oh, he's one-handed for the duration. <laughs> he's one-handed. It's he's just... got his calf muscle is, is hanging out of him. Um, he's wounded all over the place, right? But he still got fired. That's not an easy gun to fire one-handed, the is Thompson? it? Thompson? Yeah. The Thompson's a 45. It's it's if you're firing it on automatic, it's gonna rise up into the right. It's a little bit hard to hit with. I, if he's firing at single fire, which he should have been, he it, it's you could control it pretty well, okay. but I'm sure he was firing an automatic. But they're only uh, 20 round stick mags, unless he's got a drum mag, which he got from somewhere. So, you know, it's not the best weapon in the world yeah. world to have. So yeah, so the um, again. There's shooting going on. They're shooting to the left and the right. Everybody's, you know, it's, this is just a nightmare situation. The, the enemy has them at bay. The, all, the, our attack has literally gone awry. But Is he in shock at this point? I don't think he was ever in shock. No? Um, he, so he's in a lot of pain? He's in a ton of pain, but he seemed to have control of what was going on. He knew he was going to die, um, but he didn't want to die in a shitty rice paddy. So he yeah. just wanted to keep giving it to him and, and, and keep fighting, basically. He goes back. He's trying to help Timmy. And Timmy starts doing, you know, like what they do in the movies. He says, tell Janie I love her. Tell my wife I love her, right? So um, Wetzel's telling him, you know, tell her yourself. We're going we're gonna to get you out of here. So he's laying there. They're, they're putting these tourniquets on him. They're trying to, to keep him alive. And then just they're in this patty. The tide starts coming in, basically, and it's rising up above his head. So they realize, I got to get Timmy out of the water. So with one arm, with all these wounds, he's been shot in the fit. He starts dragging him across the rice paddy to get to a dike. And he's able to drag people because they're on this like watery surface. So, so he's dragging him over and he gets him up on the dike so he can um, see, so he can keep his head above water. And then when he gets there, Timmy tells him again, tell Janie I love her. And then he loses his consciousness. And at that point he's, he's gone essentially. So 
So he dies right there. He he ended up dying on a helicopter out of there, but for all intents and purposes, he was he was dead there. So this is a guy that he's been training with. He's literally been shot down four times with him now. You know, he he literally loves this guy. This is his, one this of is his, his buddy. This is someone that you trust with your life, literally, because he's the one piloting the helicopter. So he said he got mad, right? He didn't. Um, he said you don't have time to cry. You don't have to do anything else. But he got mad, so he yells. He wanted to get some of these sons of bitches, is what he said. So he does what he calls his John Wayne run. He just stood up with his one wounded leg, with his arm hanging off. His arm was in his way, so he grabbed the hand, and he shoved it in his belt. So he oh. put his dangling arm into his belt so it wouldn't get his way, and then he charges in his John Wayne run. He knows that that M60 on that helicopter is their lifeline. He's drugged this guy away to the dike, but he's got to get to that gun. So he's running. As he's running, there's, again, there's wounded and there's dying all around. There's these, the enemy has a heavy machine gun, and they're shooting all these people. They're moving around freely. They're incapacitating these people. So he's got to get to this gun. So he runs through enemy fire. They're shooting at him. He's got his Thompson. He's shooting back. He's yelling. He's screaming, you know, come on, you sons of bitches. They shoot him in the leg, and he goes down on his knee. He drops down to his knee, and he gets back up, and somehow he gets to his gun well, and he gets on that gun. When he gets on the gun, he yells, come on, you sons of bitches. Come get me. Here I am. He says he figures it's his last hurrah, so he yells, let's go, and he just starts opening up with that machine gun. So he's firing that machine gun, and he's firing. There's the waves of troops start coming at him. They start coming at him in groups. He said the only reason he thinks he was successful is he must have killed their leaders because they were coming in chaotic. They didn't know what to do. So every time he sees a body move, he's firing. He's the only machine gun operating in this whole ground. Again, we had something like 14 helicopters, so we have a massive, massive troops. There ended up being almost 52 to 54 Americans killed in this battle to give you some scope of the Dang. size, and he's the only heavy machine gun firing. He's staying on this gun. He literally, his arm is not medically, but, but um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Explosively amputated. So he shoved it into his belt. His calf's hanging off. He's got a bullet in his leg. He's got a bullet in his foot. And he's firing this machine gun yelling, right? This, this, this kid from Wisconsin just screaming, come on, you sons of bitches. And he's, he's mowing these guys down as they're yeah. coming. He fires effectively. He destroys the enemy um, resistance. He destroys their machine guns. And he destroys all major pockets of attack. So then he realizes... He's hearing screaming. He's hearing guys that are wounded. So he decides he's going to go help on these people because he, he's done what he can on this machine gun. He's losing consciousness, um, he, but he wants to go help these people. So he starts crawling around the rice paddies, and there's a medic that's been shot in the back. And, and this medic's a hero, too. This medic sets up on a dike with a bullet in his back. He can't crawl to help people because he's immobile. So Wetzel starts dragging these wounded guys to the medic so the medic can help him. Every time wow. he hears a scream, he crawls out with one arm, and now he's got a 45 pistol. He's got one arm in his belt. He's got a bullet in his foot, a bullet in his leg. He's got shrapnel. He's got wounds everywhere. He knows he's going to die, but he starts crawling. He loses consciousness from blood loss multiple times. He loses consciousness, and he wakes up. He shakes it off. He hears a scream, and he starts going again. At one point, he was crawling, and he, um, he, he saw something, and he looked, and it was an enemy soldier that was about to bayonet him. So he jumped back, and the, bay the enemy stuck him in the leg with the bayonet. He was stabbed in the right leg so far that the, the bayonet went into his bone. So he killed the guy with his forty five. had to yank the bayonet out of his leg, passed out from blood loss again, and continued to crawl. So he crawls for several hours. Eventually, the um, Americans are able to get in there, but they can't land because they're going to get shot down. So the troops have to land uh, an hour away. I'm sorry, a mile away and start walking in. But he kept saying, I knew I had a little spunk left in me, so I, I figured I would try. So he saves over a dozen people just by dragging these guys. And again, can you imagine if you're wounded, you're shot in the arm or you're shot in the leg, and you're yeah, like, oh, my God, dragging? I'm dying. And then you look up, and there's a guy with one arm that's literally dragging himself. <laughs> and then, well, he's, he's, gr he's cradling him, and he's scooting backwards to drag these people, right? These, these guys that have, I don't want to say they've given up, but their injuries are so bad that they're, they they've, they've lost all hope. They, there's tracers going off over their head. They, they feel like if I move at all, I'm going to die. And then you look up and there's this ghoul of a being that's covered with blood, that's covered, you know, because his, his clothes are covered with his blood, with Timmy's blood, with Bart's blood, with all Jesus. these guys he's training. Literally, his arm is tucked into his pants so it won't get in the way. Muscles are hanging off. He's got bullets everywhere, and he's still going. While he's dragging people, he's losing consciousness. When he wakes up, he starts dragging them again. He just doesn't have any quit in him because that's the way he was raised. He yes. said, anything I'm going to do, I'm going to do 100%. And like he said, he knew he was going to die, but he didn't want to die in some roppy, sloppy rice paddy, and he wanted to get as many sons of bitches as he could. He, that's, uh, he likes to use the word sons of bitches, and I do <laughs> I too. So I think it's a, <laughs> it's, it's a, it's a good... Um, a good one. So eventually the Americans are able to get to him and they were, they were able to rescue um, Gary Wetzel and the remaining of these guys. As soon as they threw him on the helicopter, they got him back to a field hospital where he, um, they tried to put, they cut him open immediately. They put uh, 18 uh, units of blood in him 
Um, but he, 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 uh, his heart stopped on the table, but they were able to, as a testament to the nurses and the doctors of Vietnam, they were able to save his life. Basically he survived, he survived. So he, um, when he woke up in the hospital, he ended up spending six months in the hospital. They amputated his arm again, just to show it's not hyperbole in both. They yeah. had to amputate his arm. Um, he had to get skin grafts. He had to get uh, wire uh, mesh put around his legs to keep the muscle back in. He got infections. He got all these things. And he said he, he woke up at one point during surgery, you know, and they're shoving these tubes in him and stuff. And then he'd pass back out. But yeah, six months in a hospital, his arm's amputated. He has a hook on his arm. He's still alive to this day. Rides a Harley. Just a badass Just dude. what an awesome um, guy. Holy shit. But uh, yeah, he is just, just, just a super fucking cool guy. But he said one of the things that uh, I found profound was he woke up in the hospital and he said he, he described himself as a piece of trash just laying there, you know, missing an arm, missing body parts. You know, he's got these infections, these, all these, instead of one nurse, he's got like three nurses that are trying to tend to him. But he said while he was in the hospital in Tokyo, these soldiers would come up to him. He'd wake up and there'd be a soldier there. And they would say, are you Gary Wetzel? And he'd say, yeah. And they'd pull out their wallets and they'd show him pictures of their wives and their kids. And they'd say, you're the reason I get to go home to this to to my to see my family. Oh, so damn. yeah, I thought that was pretty awesome. They you know just just all these people he never knew, he never met, but he would never would have known. But they knew who he was. They you know they woke up in a hospital. So that was that track of uh, family that right. owed to him exactly. And guys, he actually got to see it. Guys showing him a picture. This is my baby girl, and I get to see her again because of you. So Oof. so that's that's pretty awesome. Yeah. So he ended up going home. Uh, he's 20 years old <laughs> with no arm. 20? 20 years old oh at this time. He goes gosh. home. Uh, when he turns 21, he's working in a factory with one arm, and he decides he's going to buy himself a Corvette for his birthday. So he goes and he buys a Corvette. He's just a badass dude, just one of those people you can't keep down. Some uh, army officers come to visit him, and they tell him, hey, we need, you know, we need to speak to you. And he tells them, I already gave you an arm. What else do you want from me? <laughs> so they tell him, yeah, you're going to get the Medal of Honor. So he's, uh, he's flown to Washington, D.C. with his family and um, – he, uh, he ended up being awarded the Medal of Honor by uh, President Johnson. And he's, he's funny and kind of an asshole the whole time, too. He, he told a story when uh, the officers came and they said, are you Mr. Wetzel? And he said, no, he is. And he pointed to his dad because he calls it. So, oh, yeah. so they went over to his dad and they're like, sir. And then they look at his dad and they go, you didn't fight in Vietnam, did you? <laughs> and he says, no, I was in World War II. You want my son? And he just yeah. smiles. Just an <laughs> asshole, you know. But, uh, but yeah, awesome guy. Just, just, you know, that Midwestern tough, badass type, type of dude. That's amazing. A um, lot of heart of gold. Uh, he later in life, he uh, read a story of a girl with um, a physical disability. She had no fingers and arms, so she, he felt like he was similar to her. So he raised a Harley bike run, and they, they raised enough money to send her to Disneyland and send her to oh, camp and things God. like that. Yeah, super cool dude. Riding his Harley. Uh, he went down a couple years ago on his Harley. He was real real bad injured. They had to put him in the hospital again because, I mean, he's literally got... This isn't just a missing hand. He's got one arm. His his yeah. left arm's amputated all the way up near the shoulder. Um, they finally they had to you know rebuild his home. The Gary Sinise Foundation helped put in ramps and things like that. He gets home and he says, you know, I'm gonna ride my Harley again. So just a cool fucking dude. That's but, awesome. Holy yeah. crap. Damn, what is it that makes people you know like some people lay there and then some people just go? Well. Some of it, I mean, there's, there's, just like there's the physical incapacitation. There, there's gonna... some things that you can, I mean, if you're shot in the spine, you're paralyzed. All the willpower in the world yeah, is not, not going to help, help. You. But there's other people that are going to be immobilized either by quit, shock. quit, shock, or fear, you know? Yeah. Um, that Which is totally understandable. It's totally reasonable. That's, that's the standard definition. That's normal. Right? If, you're shot, if, if I shot you in the leg right now, you're going to panic and you're yeah. going to die. If you shot me, I'm going to panic and I'm going to think I'm going to die. If you do that in Vietnam when you're surrounded by burning helicopters and, you know, the radios are down and you don't expect anyone to help you, it's real easy to think, oh, my God, I'm done. And then there's the flip side of that. If you get up and run, you're probably going to die. So it's smart to stay down. You should stay down. But there's other people that just, he kept saying things like, I had a little zip in me, so I figured I'd, I'd get going. I had a little spunk in me, so I figured I'd Do you think it's trying. like knowing you're going to die? Some people just accept it, he, and other people go, he legitimately hey, if I'm going to die, then yeah. whatever. Let's go out with a bang. He's, that's what he said. He said, I, it's my last hurrah, so I figured I'll give it a go, and I want to get as many sons of bitches as I can. So he was, he was fueled by hatred. I shouldn't say hatred. He was fueled by, by rage, um, by wanting to get these guys to, to get some vengeance for his buddy who ended yeah. up dying. And that was another one of the things. Like He kept mentioning, tell Jane. I love her, right? And he years later, when he got home, he said he called and he got a hold of Janie and he he, he through tears he told her I was 
Timmy told me I was supposed to tell you I lo- or I was supposed to tell you that he loves her, you know. So yeah. he kept his promise to her and stuff like that. So we go back to that too. And every interview you see, he's kind of laughing and joking and stuff. But he's carrying all that in his heart. All those guys he saw even before his Medal of Honor action, all those dead and wounded he saw, all those names on the wall are real people to him and to yeah. other guys that were there. You know, they're not numbers, they're not lines. Those are guys that were on his bird. Those were guys that were crying. Those are guys that were screaming out. Those are guys that were in that. Um, rice patty that he wasn't able to save. Those are guys that are his crew chief. Those are guys that he served with. Those are all those guys are real human beings, flesh and blood. And he's, you know, people like him and people who didn't earn the Medal of Honor, they're carrying that in, their, yeah. in them and he's still able to maintain that, that positive um, attitude, which and is pretty awesome. The way that this battle was fought really speaks to how the, you know how you hear Vietnam people like brothers, my Vietnam. Right, exactly. It's like a real tight yeah. brotherhood. You know, I don't yeah. know much about it. Obviously, we were too young for it, but it does seem like that that specific veteran veteran community is like a large really a large tight. part of that is because of how they were treated when they got back. So they, yeah, so they, they stuck they together, formed lines, and stuck to yeah, themselves. Imagine going through know. all that shit. Exactly, and, and he then said coming it too. Home to he, spit, in one of the interviews, he on. said when, after he got the medal, people would call him and call him because you know he's famous now. And tell him you're a baby killer and you deserve to die. You know. Yeah. There were mothers who lost their children, gold star mothers who would get telegrams and get messages and get envelopes from people that said your your son deserved to die. Yeah. So yeah. So how do you you know how do you how do you live with that? I'd rather one? be like Gary then. Yeah, that. yeah. So G- Gary's one of the guys that is trying to form his brothers together and, and keep their head up and keep that pride that they obviously deserve, right? Yes. So yeah, just um, when you see someone with a Vietnam vet hat, you know, to shake that bullshit image that the that the media put on them that they're hippies and they're druggies and they're losers because they're not they're gary wetzels and they're rocky versace's and then yeah. you know duran and they're all these other guys these are the heroes that came home they did their job they did it well they did it as good or better than any generation that's ever come before them yeah. and they were treated like shit for it but they, yeah. they still held our, our flag high and he um he also one of the things he kept repeating and a lot of the things i'd read is when he sees the flag he doesn't see red white and blue he doesn't look at the flag he looks into the flag he sees all the guys that came before all the men and women who died getting us to where we are today to make us what we are and to give us those freedoms and opportunities we have yeah guys like that man yeah that that's what yeah we said it last week but that is literally what why we sit here it's when you're crazy. when your arm's blown off and you decide it's in the way so i'm just going to tuck my hand into my belt so i can keep fighting that's that's the definition of a badass right there yeah not somebody that's getting triggered by a word <laughs> yeah so you want to read the citation yeah all right so here's uh, gary wetzel's citation if I don't spill my soda. All right. Specialist 4 Wetzel. Wait, can I just say something? He looks like a total badass. See, <laughs> <laughs> so you can't see his hook hand here either. I'll show you some other he pictures. He looks there. exactly like you want him to look. <laughs> well, <laughs> the pictures before Vietnam and Vietnam, he's just, I actually, he looks cool I was on Ancestry shit. finding his high school yearbooks and stuff, yeah. and he looks like a yeah. tough kid. Like, yeah, I'm, glad not I, to, yeah. <laughs> I'm glad I didn't see that till now because yeah. that, that just puts well, the picture on the top. The picture's in Vietnam. He looks like he's going surfing, yeah. not like he's going, <laughs> so, but he's from Wisconsin. Sorry, I don't want to don't imply that he's a surfer, I'm sure you wouldn't like that. All right, Specialist 4 Wetzel, 173rd Assault assault Helicopter Company, distinguished himself by conspicuous gallantry and intrepidity at the risk of his life above and beyond the call of duty. Specialist 4 Wetzel was serving as a door gunner aboard a helicopter which was part of an insertion force trapped in a landing zone by intense and deadly hostile fire. Specialist 4 Wetzel was going to the aid of his aircraft commander when he was blown into a rice paddy and critically wounded by two enemy rockets that exploded just inches from his location. Although bleeding profusely due to the loss of his left arm and severe wounds in his right arm, chest, and left leg, Specialist Wetzel stagger, staggered to his original position in the gun well and took the enemy forces under fire. His machine gun was the only weapon placing effective fire on the enemy at that time. Through his own resolve, he overcame the shock and intolerable pain, intolerable pain of his injuries, Specialist 4 Wetzel remained at his position until he had eliminated the automatic weapons emplacement that had been inflicting heavy casualties on American troops and preventing them from moving against the strong enemy force. Refusing to tend to his own extensive wounds, he attempted to return to the aid of his aircraft commander, but passed out from loss of blood. Regaining consciousness, he persisted in his efforts to drag himself to the aid of fellow crewmen. After an agonizing effort, he came to the side of a crew chief who was attempting to drag the wounded aircraft commander to the safety of a nearby dike. Unswerving to the devotion of his fellow man, Specialist 4 Wetzel assisted his crew chief even though he lost consciousness once again during the action. Specialist 4 Wetzel displayed extraordinary heroism in his efforts to aid his fellow crewmen. 
His gallant actions were in keeping with the highest traditions of the U.S. Army and reflect great credit upon himself and the armed forces of his country. Man, that was awesome. Yeah. Another one of my favorites. That's a good one. Another dude. badass army dude. Yeah. Damn. Where does he live now? Uh, he's still in Wisconsin. Uh, according to Wikipedia, it says he still works in a factory. I doubt he does now. But he, tell, he again, as a Medal of Honor recipient, though, with one arm, with all these other disabilities, he, he stayed that blue-collar, Harley-riding dude. Badass. You know, just a badass Harley-riding dude. That's awesome. What a good one. Yeah. Man. So. All right, guys. Thank you so much for watching and listening. Any comments in the comment section? Share the show. That's the best thing you could do for us is share it with your friends to get the word out for these awesome guys. Anything else? Thanks again for listening. We'll see you next week. Cool.